day that the Lord has made. We are grateful to gather together for worship this morning. Welcome to Bethlehem Covenant. It is good to be together as his people. We hope that this morning and the Spirit of God is among us as we hear from his word, as we join together our hearts in prayer, as we sing songs of worship, that God would be present among his people. We're delighted to have Sarah Pageant with us this morning sharing music with us, and we pray that all of these things are used by God to meet our hearts this morning. Would you join together in standing as we read responsively our call to worship found in your bulletin as well as on the screens? Come and let us give thanks to God. Come, let us give thanks to Christ. We gather together to sing of the one who called us to serve those who are hungry and alone at this time of year. Come, let us give thanks to the Spirit. We gather together to exalt the one who will grow us to God, not only our family and heart, but the guests of the We invite you to join together. In hymn number 654, come, you thankful people, come. Let's worship together. Our prayer this morning is found in your bulletin as well as is on the screen. 
Let's pray together. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
As we continue in worship, we take a moment to pass the peace, and we notice the promise of God that his peace would be among us as his people gather. So take a moment at this point in worship and stand as you're able and pass God's peace to one another. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Deb Schold. The tel- Old Testament scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, and that can be found on page 243 of your Pew Bible if you'd like to follow along. <clears throat> Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in my God. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your victory. There is no holy one like the Lord, no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble gird on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry are fat with spoil. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he also exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the Lord are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked will perish in darkness, for not by might does one prevail. The Lord, his adversaries, will be shattered. The Most High will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed. And the New Testament reading is found in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 through 14, and continues in verses 19 through 25. This can be found on page 1095 in the Pew Bible. And every priest stands day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since then has been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of the Lord. 
And now if you are able, please stand and let's sing hymn number 99, We Gather Together. You may be seated. Will you join me in prayer before we turn to God's word? God, we thank you for the truth of your gospel, your good news that you have placed into our hearts. And we pray, God, that as we turn to your word now, you would do your work among us to deepen our commitment to you and to one another. It's in your name that we pray. All God's people said, amen, amen. Well, this section of scripture that Deb just read for us, and we'll be focusing on Hebrews 10, starting with verses 19, it begins with the word, therefore, which tells us that we need to look at what came before in order to understand what will come. And what came before are nine chapters where the author of the book of Hebrews has been building this case that Jesus is better that Jesus is better. He is better than the prophets. He is better than the angels. He is better than Moses. He is better than the priesthood. He is better than the old covenant. He is better than Old Testament sacrifices. And so one of the natural questions would be for us to ask, why has the author gone to such great lengths to convince the people that Jesus is better than all these other options? And the reality is that the church is at the point in their faith where they are at a crossroads. And this crossroads isn't defined by one thing, but rather a myriad of reasons that we find clues from in chapter 10. Things like ongoing persecution and imprisonment, leading people to question whether this faith in Jesus was a really new and better way some ultimately choosing to leave their faith altogether. Which might explain why the author of the book of Hebrews seems to be so intense in his challenge to the church at this point in the book. And I want to remind you this morning that as we engage in these words, that we're reading scripture as not just information to be digested, but they are words that are directed towards a group of people who are being called to live in an entirely new way. 
And frankly, there is a lot at stake for them because they can either continue to follow Jesus even while their circumstances are hard, or they can veer off towards one of the many different paths being offered to them. This text is a high challenge text. It can push some buttons as it calls into question not only our actions, but our motivation behind our actions. It helps us examine not only what we do, but why we do it. Ultimately, with the hopes that the people will dig deep into the way of Jesus and they'll continue to follow him in the face of hardship. It's like the author knew that in the face of trials, even their motivations would need to be brought under gospel transformation for they, they're, them to make it out on the other side with their faith intact. And so this final verse in chapter 10 is like a coach rallying a team before the game when they, he writes, but we are not among those who shrink back and are so lost, but among those who have faith and are so saved. Ever feel like you want to shrink back? Have you felt the challenges of continuing to follow Jesus? Maybe it's a particular teaching. Maybe it's showing up at church. Maybe it's engaging in all the relationships. Maybe it's the pressure of a culture that doesn't value church in the way it once did. Sometimes we can feel it, the desire to shut down, the desire to get smaller, to roll it back, to maybe put a blanket over our head and hit the snooze button on the alarm clock one more time, right? So why the author of Hebrews ends with the statement of identity, writing, this is not who we are. This is not who we are. Instead, as God's people, we dig in. We name our faith again. We stand on the once and forever nature of our salvation. In other words, if you feel that temptation to shrink this morning, this word is for you. Look at verse 19 with me. It starts with these words, Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus. Now notice right off the bat that the author assumes confidence. Since we have confidence. And I'll just tell you that my instinct is to pause and say, No, 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 like dear author of Hebrews. Like you are making confidence sound easy right? You are making it sound like it's something I don't have to muster up or give myself a pep talk about, but you talk about it like it's something I already have. To which the author might say, exactly. Exactly. You do. You see, confidence can be described as frankness, outspoken speech, openness to public scrutiny, courage, boldness, fearlessness, and joy. That's a tall order. Anyone? A tall order. And so this week when I read what commentator Susan Eastman wrote on this word of confidence, it touched my heart. Here's what she writes. Confidence is a characteristic of free citizens who may hold their heads up without shame or fear, looking others directly in the eye. In Roman society, slaves did not exercise such boldness. It belonged to the free members of the household. In Hebrews, it it characterizes members of God's household. Indeed, we are God's house, God's dwelling, God's temple, over which Christ is the faithful overseer and high priest. It is because of this reality that confidence can characterize every aspect of our lives, from our relationship with God to relationships within and outside the church. Friends, Hebrews 4 reminded us that before God, nothing is hidden, that we are all naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one whom we must render an account God already sees our inmost thoughts and motives, so before him there is no need to hold back, which means, friends, confidence is your birthright. Confidence is your birthright. And we can do this because Jesus is better. 
Notice what the text reminds us about, what he has accomplished. In verse 20, the author says, Jesus has made a new and living way. And then in verse 21, that he has become our great high priest over the house of God. This great high priest has given his life once and for all, opening up the pathway to salvation, freeing us from our guilty conscience that tells us we're not good enough, that we've made too many mistakes, that we'll never get it right, or we're going to screw it all up anyway, so we shouldn't even try. Jesus has cleansed us with his blood, and he has removed all the obstacles traditionally that have gotten in the way. In other words, the path to the throne of grace, the holy of holies, where only priests typically would enter, has been made available to you. And you, dear friends, as Pastor Timothy Keller once used to say, you can just waltz right in. Now, here's where the author digs into three separate challenges to the church. <clears throat> and these challenges should help us understand what the proper response is to Jesus. These challenges all begin with the words, let us. Let us. And so I want to remind you that these words are relational language. These words are community language. These words are church language. This is not a word to an individual, but it is a word for a people, a community about things that are made possible because he has given us this new and living way. And the first thing is this. We can draw near to God. We can draw near to God, and it's hard to communicate as we sit here in this space just how shocking this news would have been. The word near communicates proximity. It's almost intimate in nature. This would not have been a, use, a word used to describe God. God's presence was something to be feared. Picture Moses on Mount Sinai hiding his face, not being able to look directly at the presence of God, certain that if he did, he would die. But also, if you spend any time in the Old Testament, you'll notice that the Israelites, when they were called together to worship in the temple, this was language that was used to draw near, to gather and this wasn't just like an internal reality that we could be with Jesus, but it was a physical invitation to come, to move towards one another, to be with God and his people. There's a tangible presence to being the people of God. And it's foundational for our faith. And for whatever reason, the church was fine with Jesus but they didn't feel the need to be connected to the family of Jesus. They wanted God, but they didn't really want people. <laughs> Ever feel that way? They wanted God, but they didn't really want to deal with people. And this isn't for us a new problem. Pastor Dan Kimball, a number of years ago, wrote a book with this title, They Like Jesus, But Not the Church. <laughs> they Like Jesus, But Not the church, and this is what the writer of the Hebrews is getting at, because to be in relationship with Jesus requires us to be in relationship with one another. The gift and the challenge, right? <laughs> and yet we have separated our relationship with God from people. You cannot have a relationship with God without having a relationship with people. This is the simple and scandalous teaching throughout the New Testament. How do you love God? Not simply through praying, not simply through reading the Bible, but through our connection and love towards his people. Theologian Lillian Daniel once wrote these words, Anyone can find God in the picturesque mountaintop, a hiking trail, or a sunset. The miracle is that I can find God in the company of other people who are just as annoying as I am. What we see in the Bible is that there is not a love for God without a love for his people. The second let us that we see in this text is in verse 23, and it says, let us hold fast 
to the confession of our hope. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Now, a lot of times when we think about confession, we might equate it with an apology, kind of a needed I'm sorry for something we've said or done. But confession here is the name that something is true. It is acknowledging our hope. Acknowledging our hope is being able to name the very truth of what we place our faith in. That as we gather together, we remember again what is the core of the core of the core of our faith that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, lived among us, went to the cross on our behalf, taking on the full weight of our sin, and then defeating death through his resurrection. This is the good news, and frankly, friends, it can be slippery. It can be slippery. It's a strange message. It's a strange message. And oftentimes when we are together, the truth of what it all means, it seems so clear, but then we have to go into the rest of the week, right? And things are hard. And there's a lot of noise, and I'm not even just talking about external noise, but the internal noise, the competing voices, the challenging narratives, the feelings that we need to overcome. And suddenly, <clears throat> the truth that we claimed on Sunday seems to feel zoomed out on Monday. And we look at the picture and we think, could it be true? Was it true? And is it even relevant to the rest of my life? Friends, this doesn't mean that that truth has any less power, but it just means as humans, we can be fickle, we can be forgetful, and we live our lives focused often on what is right in front of us, right? I love this word from St. Augustine. He wrote a reflection on the word association. And we have all sorts of different associations, whether they're community-based or they're groups of common interests. But he wrote these words. Association is a community of individuals who agree on their object of affection. Association is a community of individuals who agree on their object of affection. When you are in a dynamic association, there are these high levels of agreement about what matters most, that you are all in this together and there is this transcendence that moves beyond the individual, a sense of agreement among each other that says, we are going to agree that this is our object of affection and we are going to aim our lives in that direction and move towards it together. That is association. And what happens is that the church, in that is the object of our affection in the church is Jesus. It is Jesus. It is not social justice. It is not having certain small groups or classes. It is not certain issues in society, but it is the very Son of God. And when we keep Jesus Christ as the center of all we do, then we can, can't help but move beyond our gatherings, moving out into the places that advocate for the needs of others, places that serve our community, places that invite smaller gatherings of Christians to learn and to grow. But these things flow from one core affection, and that is Jesus. The final let us that we see in this text is maybe make more straightforward in words, but harder in action. Straightforward in words, harder in action. Here's what it says in verse 23. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds. Interesting language there, isn't it? Provoke one another to love and good deeds. Not neglecting to meet together as in the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Provoke each other towards love and good deeds. Let me ask you, how does one provoke someone to love? Because when I picture provoking, it's as an older sister of two younger brothers who knew exactly how to provoke. 
Provoking involves irritation. Provoking involves exasperation. But how does one provoke to love? How does one irritate someone into good works? Commentator Catherine Shainer describes this as an irritation of love. She writes this, instead of asserting a community built on sameness and good feeling, the Hebrew author seems to note that provocation and exasperation is actually a part of being a community. <laughs> it's actually a part of being a community. The author exhorts us to build a kind of community gathering that relentlessly, even irritatingly, suggests that actions of love and deeds are not what create faith, but are rather the responsibility of the community, which needs to gather because of their faith in the great high priest, a faith that gives, that God gives, and a love that God builds among his people. Let me just give you an example of that. Um, the late Larry Crabb, who was a Christian author and speaker, um, he wrote a book a number of years back called Connecting, and that book in a random way was a part of my call to ministry as a college student. And he writes these words about encouragement. <clears throat> he says, as a youngster, I developed a thoroughly, annoyingly, and humiliating problem of stuttering. He says, in the ninth grade, I was elected president of our junior high body. And so during the assembly of the seventh, eighth, and ninth graders, several hundred students, I was called to the front by the principal to join him on stage for the induction ceremony and asked to repeat these words, I, Larry Crabb of Plymouth Whitmarsh Junior High School, do hereby promise. <laughs> he says, that's how the principal said it, but my version was a bit different, filled with stutters and awkward pauses and a quick buildup of dripping sweat off my forehead. He reflects, a short time later, our church celebrated communion on a Sunday morning worship um, service. It was customary in our congregation to encourage youth to enter into leading worship by standing and praying out loud. And that particular Sunday, I sensed the pressure of the saints, not, I fear, the leading of the Spirit. And I responded by unsteadily leaving my chair for the first time with the intention of praying. Filled less with worship than with nervousness, I found my theology becoming confused to the point of heresy. I remember thanking the Father for hanging on the cross, praising Christ for triumphantly bringing the Spirit from the grave. Stuttering throughout, I finally thought of the word amen, which was perhaps the first evidence of the Spirit's leading, and I sat down. I recall staring at the floor, too embarrassed to look around, and solemnly vowing again, never again to pray or speak out loud in front of a group. When the service was over, I darted toward the door, not wishing to encounter an elder who might feel obliged to correct my twisted theology, but I was not quick enough. He says, an older Christian man named Jim Dunbar intercepted me, put an arm around his shoulder, cleared his throat to speak, and I remember thinking to myself, here it comes, and I then listened to this godly gentleman speak words that I can repeat verbatim today more than 20 years later. Larry, he said, there's one thing I want you to know. Whatever you do for the Lord, I'm behind you 1,000%. And then he walked away. And he writes, even as I write these words, my eyes fill with tears. Those words were life words. Those words had power. They reached deep into my being and my resolve never to speak publicly weakened instantly. Since the day those words were spoken, God has led me into a ministry in which I regularly address and pray before crowds of all sizes. I do it without stuttering. I love it. Not only death, but also life lies in the power of the tongue. And God intends for us to be people who use words to encourage one another. Dear friends, discouragement is everywhere. Discouragement is everywhere. We don't need just a sprinkling of encouragement, but we need to build cultures of encouragement. 
We need to be asking ourselves, am I contributing to greater discouragement? Is my presence uplifting and lightening others' loads? And encouragement is not about cliches, but it is about depositing life into someone else. Who can I encourage today? And we do this, dear friends, because it's what God has done for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, it's often when we have something in common is when we move towards someone else. And that's just our basic humanity. It's how we work. But what we find in the gospel is something much more profound, that God moves towards a sinful world in forgiving grace and compassionate love. He draws near to us. He forgives us. He offers us salvation, a new future, a new heart, a new perspective, salvation, and a relationship. And it's out of this that we can do the same for one another. So let us draw near to God. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope. And let us provoke one another to love and good deeds in the name of Jesus our great high priest. Amen. Amen. In the book of Romans, Paul tells us that our offering is a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Our offering isn't a segmented reality, but involves our whole lives, our whole selves, our whole being. We're grateful that God has called us together, but he also invites us to be 
wholehearted in our giving as well. And this morning we give to that end. We give reflecting a generous God. We give reflecting our whole hearts. And we give towards his good purposes. So will the ushers please come forward.
You may be seated. <clears throat> As we sang in that doxology, we recognize that our source of blessing and our source of gifts comes from, comes from God. I want to invite um, Wally Abramson up um, to share a little update with us, and then we'll move into a time of prayer. So Wally, share with us. So last Thursday evening, uh, church council met for its uh, regularly scheduled monthly meetings, and, and the Finance Commission presents, as it always does, its, its financial report kind of year to date. And, uh, and the report was kind of grim. And so we don't usually do this during a worship service, but felt that it's important for everyone to know. So uh, the, the slide you're seeing, the graph, is probably provides some kind of context. Um, this is the last five years of where we are this time of year. And on the left is 2020. And the little green at the bottom of 2020 shows that we were in the, in the black by almost $50,000. And as the years have progressed, 2024 on the right side there, we're projecting, uh, we were at, uh, actually was, I think, $58,000 in the red uh, at the end of October, the last month. And so, we, now we normally have a strong November, December, like most churches do. Um, even if we have a strong, normal November, December, uh, we'll probably wind up about $25,000 in the red. So, um, this isn't a problem of, of spending. It's, it's been a problem of income for us. We're still kind of finding our feet post-COVID. A lot of changes here. And so it's really an, an income problem, not an expense problem. We made some course corrections throughout the year, and we're still at this point. So we have six weeks, though, to kind of right the ship, you know, get, get at, at least break-even point. I'm confident we can do that. Council is actually going to take the first swipe at this. And uh, everyone uh, on council was there except for one person, and we all agreed, I think, to say we'll, we'll do something to do this. So we're asking uh, everyone else to do what they can between now and uh, December 29th, which is the last Sunday we meet. Um, so let me encourage you and, I guess, provoke provoke each other to do what we can do as we are gifted and, and able to do. Um, and also following up on that, you know, after this year is over, we're, we're currently in the, in the midst of, of putting together the 2025 budget, which will reflect, I think, this new reality of finding our feet where we are at, you know, and who's here, where our income is going to be at. So that, that new budget, which you will be able to approve on January 5th, will probably reflect uh, in a further decrease in spending than we currently have. So we're on the right track. We just need to meet this challenge between now and December 29th. Um, people who are on the Finance Commission besides me is uh, Chris Simon, Steve Lindquist, um, Christine Obert, uh, Bob Schoberg, I think Mary Jones Morris. I'm, Norm, I'm not sure if Mary is still on the commission or not, but <laughs> maybe not. But you can talk to any one of us as well if you have some special questions about it. So, so thank you, uh, all of you, for what you have been doing throughout the year and the years. And just be mindful and prayerful for what you can do to help us erase this deficit between now and December 29th. Thank you. And we're grateful that Mike Watson has um, taken on Mary Jones Morse role on that commission. So feel free to reach out to any of those individuals and uh, we'll turn together in prayer. So will you join me? Lord, you have intentionally placed us in your wonderful world. At this time, together with your church, in the midst of its blessings and its difficulties. And you call us to be peacemakers and people who will work along with you, empowered by you, offering our lives and our gifts in your service. 
But we sometimes, we hold back from trusting in these gifts you have given to us. We wonder if they will be enough to make a difference. And we become caught in the trap of believing that only the largest gifts have any worth. Forgive us when we slide so easily into our fears of inadequacy. Each of us have been blessed and each is called to be a blessing. There are no small and insignificant gifts for God to bless and use. Free us from the fears of not enough and help us to joyfully place our hopes, our dreams, and our lives in your care. God, we pause to name those in our congregation knowing that as we come before you, you know not only their names but their deepest needs. God, we praise you for Bill Hunstock's continued recovery after his stroke. God, you have been near in not only the big things but in the small details, and for that we are grateful. For Bodil Enderton and Rich as he continues to provide care in these days. For Rita Johnson and her continued recovery from heart surgery, and for Marilyn Lester as she is in hospice. God, thank you that in the midst of these challenges, we can experience a joy that only comes from you. We pray that you be with Jan Norman and her family after the homegoing of Pat. Would you rush in with your peace as well as their confidence in life everlasting. And as we have lifted up names and situations today, seeking your healing mercies and comforting power, Help us to feel those same mercies and comfort active in our lives, reminding us that your love is poured out on us so that we may serve. Strengthen and encourage us as we move forward in ministry, seeking to be good stewards of all that you have given to us. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We continue in worship this morning. I just want to invite um, Pastor Laura up, and we have a couple of announcements from those in our congregation today. As we draw to the end of this church calendar year, next Sunday we will celebrate Christ the King Sunday. And along with that, we have a couple of opportunities, um, one of them being during our in between services time, our community time, we are going to support our college students um, with a pop-up store, which means that there will be items that we are going to um, package and send off care packages to our college students. And you um, are invited to participate in that by purchasing the items and then we will box them up and ship them off. We'll also have cards there so you can write a note of encouragement to our students. They approach finals and writing papers and taking tests. If that's been an experience you've had, perhaps you can tap back into like, whew, that's like a weighty time. And we wanna support them and remind them that um, their church family here at Bethlehem loves them and we're thinking about them at this time of year. So we, I invite you to come next Sunday and participate in our pop-up store for our college students. Also next Sunday at 6.30, we will have a Thanksgiving service this is also an opportunity, not only because we are in this season of Thanksgiving, but I like that it coincides with Christ the King Sunday this year, um, that we end this year gathering together to name the ways that God has been faithful in our lives and in the lives of this church community. Um, and there's going to be dessert. So <laughs> we're just going to like savor the goodness um, of what God has done and what God will continue to do um, alongside sharing in some yummy deliciousness. So we invite you to come to that next Sunday at 6.30. And then I'd like to invite up Deb to give an announcement um, regarding our global outreach. This is... Uh not just local, also will include some global opportunities. Um, just a reminder that we as a church community are driven to embody Jesus' Jesus's great commandment to love others and scripture's call to serve those in our neighborhood, communities, and throughout the world. 
We strive to prioritize the needs of others above our own agendas, foster meaningful connections, and be available to share the gospel to all who are interested. In an effort to follow these commandments, Bethlehem Covenant is involved in local and global outreach and um, want to keep you informed of some of the ways we're doing this. That is our mission statement for the global or the outreach commission. Um, for local outreach, um, a few volunteers have started attending Dowling School weekdays from be between 9.15 and 9.45 as breakfast buddies. Um, in this role, they're greeting the children, supporting the staff, helping the small hands open cartons and juice boxes and stuff without spilling, and just be an encouragement to the children. Um, there are several openings for people who may still want to at participate in this way. Uh, it's just a half hour weekday mornings. Um, if you have questions, you can talk to Connie Smith, Deirdre Dahl, uh, Sharon Boswell, Rick Daly, or Megan Johnson, who are already doing this, and if they, they would have a hands-on experience to tell you about. Um, we also put bags of food in kids' backpacks once a week for their weekend meals when there might be food um, uh, instability at home, and uh, that happens on Fridays or on the last day of before a break or an extended weekend. Um, for the month of November, Dowling Elementary has let us know that they could use some new or gently used, no stains or holes, but um, winter items, particularly winterproof mittens in kids' sizes, small, medium, and large, on sweatpants or elastic waist pants in youth sizes, small, large, extra large, and adult. Um, these items can be brought to church throughout the month of November and placed in a bin provided in the atrium. And Connie informed me this morning that the bin has already been emptied twice. So thank you so much to those who are already donating, but we could, they would appreciate some more. Um, out front in church, you've maybe noticed the little red free pantry um, that Bethlehem is collecting non-perishable food donations, and um, you can bring these items. We want to make sure it's things that won't be affected by freezing temperatures because it will be outside in the winter. Um, and we suggest that maybe donations be brought on communion Sundays. Um, just as a reminder that it's consistent, but we'll accept it any time that you want to bring anything. Simple suppers are a chance to meet neighbors and child care families who are coming to our Wednesday evening suppers prepared at church, and we serve these at 4, 545. We do need volunteers to set up tables and chairs and do some uh, simple food prep. And the food prep's about 430, and the tables and chairs about 515. Um, before the meals, and then we need more people to serve and to clean up afterwards. For this week, November 20th, um, we need one more person to help set up and do food prep and one person more for serving and cleanup. Otherwise, the schedule is filled up for this week. There won't be a simple supper on November 27th as it's the set Wednesday before Thanksgiving, but December 4th, we need a lot of people. <laughs> Um, so look at the clipboard sign-up sheets in the atrium under the media screen. Um, and you can also sign up through Planning Center if that's your preference. Regarding global outreach, we want everyone to know and get to know and pray for the four um, global personnel families that we support from Bethlehem. Each month there will be a new family to pray for listed in the bulletin, and this month it is Letha Curl, um, who is the... Um, uh, coordinator for Europe missions and um, uh, weekly they'll put a fact or, or uh, uh, yeah a fact about the missionary family being supported up on the media screen in the atrium so take note of that just to get better acquainted with them this month um, uh, if you'd like to receive online newsletters from our uh, global personnel families you can sign up for that through the office, um, or um, you can also get um, pick up a, a little booklet. There's a prayer calendar booklet out there that's free, just to, for, and that includes all of the Covenant's um, global personnel with a little fact about them, and, and um, that's very interesting to, on a daily basis, um, read up about them. Uh, and then for today, we like are going to send a um, birthday or Christmas greetings to our global personnel families. 
and they, I've set up a little display table and um, Christmas stationery. So if you would like to just write a little greeting, even if it's just a Merry Christmas from, your, and sign your name, or a little more, just tell them about yourself or how you're celebrating. Um, our fair, four families are Jared and Hannah, oh, I, Jared and Hannah Baker, and um, uh, Letha Curl, and Jana and Fabia Mooney's, and um, Steve and Barb Swanson. Um, and just as a side note, uh, the Swansons are going to would be appreciate prayer because they're going through a re visa renewal process. So thank you for your willingness to serve or consider serving in these ways. There's lots of opportunities, and we'd love to have you join us. Thanks, Deb. Finally, I just want to note that our Advent devotionals, thank you for those of you who have signed up to participate. If you're just like, ooh, I didn't quite get that in this week, you can still turn it in today or online um, this afternoon, either in the office or there's a QR code where you can submit your form online. But we look forward to um, reading those devotionals during the season of Advent, which is just around the corner. Now will you join me as we join in standing as you're able as we sing our ascending hymn number 31. Now thank we all our God. receive these words of benediction from Hebrews 10, which is in the paraphrase of the message. It says, so let's do it. Full of belief, confident that we're presentable inside and out. Let's keep a firm grip on the promises that keep us going. He always keeps his word. Let's see how inventive we can be in encouraging love and helping out, not avoiding worshiping together as some do, but spurring each other on, especially as we see the big day approaching. Amen and amen.